Well, good afternoon, everybody. And first, thank you, Neil, for giving me the opportunity to present our latest uh, research. So, before moving to how to design the next generation of vaccines, uh, let's, let me spend one slide on what is today's situation. And we've already seen that slide many, many times today and yesterday, but this gives a very nice overview of uh, what we have today as common vaccines. And actually, the latest technology, with, which is reverse vaccinology, and which I'm pleased to uh, say that is a reality today, as 2013 is the event of the first vaccine that has been uh, approved based on that technology. And this is a vaccine uh, against meningococcus B. So what about the next generation? We heard a lot about what we need to design improved vaccines or vaccines against disease that we don't have yet uh, protection for. And we heard a lot about adjuvants, how immune responses can predict and help us in designing new adjuvants. We just heard from Donata uh, the incredible work that is done uh, through the Aditech Consortium to uh, develop new technologies. And what I would like to do in the next 20 minutes is uh, to convince you about the power of synthetic biology and more specifically about some self-amplifying messenger RNA, which is one of the uh, novel approach that we have embarked on uh, at Novartis. So what is uh, self-amplifying mRNA or in short, SAM vaccines? Well, the vision is to develop synthetic vaccine with the in vivo properties of viral vectored vaccines, but without the complication of cell culture production or of anti-vector immunity. Clearly, they have still to be safe, and we would like them to be scalable and also widely applicable, so as a platform. So what we have developed at Novartis is essentially an RNA-based vaccine, synthetic RNA, delivered with a synthetic uh, delivery system, here exemplified as lipid nanoparticles. So what is an, a replicant or SAM or self-amplifying mRNA vaccine? So this is genomic RNA based on an alpha virus backbone consisting of non-structural proteins that are, in, um, that are important for RNA replication in the host cell and also to allow protein expression, protein of our interest. That uh, genomic RNA does not contain uh, structural pr proteins, which means that it cannot make infectious, infectious virus particles. And so far, we have used uh, alpha virus based RNA, but we can also use other viral sources like fly viruses, spicornaviruses, etc. So, instead of the structural proteins, we have replaced those by the gene of interest. And so far, we have successfully tested several uh, viral proteins as well as some bacterial antigens. And also of importance, for example, for uh, influenza uh, vaccines, if we are thinking about universal vaccine, but also for other diseases, we can express more than one protein in that kind of uh, delivery system. So how does it work? Well, the first thing is that you need to synthesize the RNA, and this is an enzymatic reaction in a tube that starts from a DNA template. This RNA is then formulated uh, with a synthetic delivery system and injected in the host. So in the host, the uptake mechanism is likely either through endocytosis or through direct fusion with the host uh, cells. And once in the host cell, the genomic RNA starts to replicate and also start to uh, express the gene or the protein of interest. 
And because this is still a foreign element, replication of uh, that RNA will also self-adjuvant the vaccine by interacting through dump molecule of the host cells. So the overall reaction is inducing a potent immune response in the host. How does, get, uh, as, how does some get produced, uh, as I mentioned, is a simple enzymatic transcription reaction starting from a DNA template. And this is based on a T7 RNA polymerase uh, for which in vitro transcription reactions are extensively described in the literature. There are commercial kits available for small-scale production of about one milligram of RNA. We have already a GMP uh, production uh, ready uh, for small size RNA of about uh, two kilobases. Uh, there are still some limitation with the production of larger uh, 9 kb RNA, but this is not insurmountable. In terms of producing this kind of RNA at a commercial scale, which is clearly what is needed if we want to make that as a vaccine, as a product, uh, is not that difficult because it all resides in a cell-free in vitro transcription reaction. And with a simple purification process give, and sterile filtration process, give rise to more than 99% of pure RNA. This whole process takes less than eight hours. And in terms of yield, we get five to six milligram of pure RNA from every single milliliter of the transcription reaction. And this is about equivalent to 50 to 60 human doses if we assume a 100 microgram of RNA dose uh, for human. So this, is, this has a large potential, already 50 doses for one ml. If we scale up to uh, liters, we can easily reach millions of doses in a very short time. How do we formulate this RNA? I mentioned uh, this is all synthetic delivery systems, and currently in our first generation vaccines, we are testing two different approaches one based on uh, lipo, uh, lipid nanoparticles, or in short, LNPs, and another one based on cationic nanoemulsion, or in short, CNEs. And this is really m based on the fact that we would like to try to take advantage of what a real viral delivery uh, system makes, but without the inconvenience. And I'm going to show you today two examples, one with each um, delivery systems. And we are moving forward and already working on second generation vaccines, improving both delivery systems and uh, vectors. So the first example is from our influenza program. And we had the chance uh, in 2013, spring of 2013, to actually test our capacity to respond quickly to an influenza outbreak with the H7 and 9. And um, we were able from start from um, posting on the web of the H7 sequence to come up with an RNA vaccine within eight days. So this shows the, the strength of uh, information shipping information rather than shipping viruses, as we all know that if we have to wait until viruses have been rescued and shipped from uh, uh, CDC and WHO, that can take up to uh, several months. So in some details, um, I'm going to walk you through the sequence of those eight days. Essentially day one, the sequence of the H7 and 9 uh, outbreak, influenza outbreak was released on the web. The next day, oligos were ordered and synthesis of the H7 gene was started and was completed on day three, where the gene was actually shipped to our laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. On day four, we receive 
the gene sequence, we receive the primers to uh, start PCR, amplify the gene, and clone it, cloned it into the replicant plasmid that uh, gave rise to uh, RNA sequencing. So the replicant plasmid was purified, the sequence was verified and linearized for transcription on day six. On day seven, we had the RNA produced and by day eight, we, have conf we had confirmed the RNA integrity uh, by uh, denaturing agarose gels. And we have also confirmed protein expression by BHK uh, transfected cells by immunoblotting with an anti-HA antibody. That RNA went into animal studies. So we immunized mice with one microgram of the RNA formulated with the LNP uh, system delivery. Animals receive two immunization at a three week mm -hmm. interval. And already two weeks after the first immunization, we were able to detect um, H7 specific HI titers in the immunized mice as well as uh, virus neutralization titers. All the mice had converted uh, two weeks later. Those titers were boosted after the second immunization, as you can see here. Interestingly, uh, if the RNA naked was, was injected in those animals, we were not able to see any responses after prime or even after a second dose of naked RNA, uh, indicating that it is very important to formulate the uh, the RNA to protect from degradation. So in those studies, we didn't have a subunit vaccine uh, protein as a control. So in order to benchmark and compare the SAM approach to a more conventional influenza vaccine, we repeated those experiments using uh, H1N1 a California from 2009 for which we had a seasonal vaccine. So what I'm showing you here are two sets of uh, experiments where we compared two different doses of SAM, 0.1 and 1 microgram, and two different uh, boosting intervals, a three week and an eight week between prime and boost. Um, I'm showing you here H1 specific HI titers, but we got similar results if we were measuring total IgG or uh, virus neutralizing titers. So in substance, what we show is that at the two doses, either post one or post two, some vaccine behaved in an equivalently to the subunit protein. We had also included an MF59 adjuvanted uh, subunit to, as a gold standard, really what the dream, what we would like to achieve. Uh, in mice, we are not quite there yet with our first generation vaccines. What we also learned from those experiments is that increasing the time between the first and the second immunization to eight weeks further improve and enhance the, the uh, uh, HI titers that we were uh, getting in these animals. So then we moved on to uh, ferret studies. And for those studies, we already tested our second generation <laughs> vaccine with improved vectors and also improved delivery systems. And what I'm showing you here uh, are again H1 specific HI titers measured um, two times, at two different times post first immunization in blue or two weeks after the second immunization in red. And again, we are comparing two different doses of some vaccine, a, a five and a 15 microgram versus non-adjuvanted subunit protein at 15 micrograms or the MF59 adjuvanted subunit still at 15 microgram. 
And to our pleasure, what we could observe is that in ferrets, and unlike what we observed in mice with the first generation vaccine, now after two immunization, HI titers ob obtained at the highest dose of the SAM vaccine were now comparable to the MF59 adjuvanted uh, subunit vaccines. And where uh, superior to what we would get with the non-adjuvanted subunit vaccines. So this is indicating uh, the, the power of the SAM vaccine in the influenza model and using a delivery system that is based on lipid nanoparticle. The second example that I would like to share with you uh, this afternoon is from our uh, HIV program and uh, in that uh, program, we tested GP140 antigen de uh, delivered with our CNE, which is the cation uh, nanoemulsion, cationic nanoemulsion. So, in those studies, non human primate uh, animals were used, and we had three different groups animals which were immunized with uh, VRPs with SAM vaccine encoding the uh, GP140 antigen or with subunit GP140 uh, adjuvanted with MF59. The schedule was uh, somewhat complicated in the sense that animals received three doses of either VRP or SAM followed by two doses of protein of subunit. In the context of the subunit, they, all, they receive all, uh, only the subunit. What we, can clear, what we can see is that after the second dose, the SAM vaccine group, in the SAM vaccine group, all the animals had zero converted. And titers, uh, here we are looking at envelope-specific uh, IgG titers, titer kept uh, increasing after each uh, boost. If we look after the last immunization on week 38 for neutralization titers in those animals, we can see that the HIV SAM vaccine group had titers equivalent to the group receiving the MF59 adjuvanted uh, GP140, while the VRP group uh, was somewhat lower. In addition, we were also able to see a, a much greater T cell responses with the SAM vaccine. And here we are looking at interferon gamma uh, L spot after each um, immunization, uh, so over time. And here we are looking at the, the medians of the different uh, animals. And as you can see, in the HIV SAM vaccine group, we had very elevated uh, frequencies of interferon gamma secreting cells, much more than in the MF59 adjuvanted groups, and also stronger than in the VRP immunized groups. So this is all data in non-human primate and promising data that is uh, encouraging us to move forward and to bring that technology uh, to humans. So in summary, and for what are our next steps, I think we have demonstrated in uh, several different diseases, I picked only two today uh, to show you for sake of time, but we have applied the technology in many other diseases. We have achieved proof of concept for the SAM vaccine. Um, this technology has the potential as a platform to address multiple disease targets, and we already published on that uh, last year for our, our RSV. And I also showed you this afternoon uh, the rapid response capability with our response to pandemic flu, eight days to have an RNA. Clearly, it was in the lab, it was not million doses, but that leaves us with uh, a margin uh, that is easy to beat the conventional way of making uh, influenza vaccine today. So for the next step, we are uh, in the process of establishing GMP production. 
and to enter uh, test in human clinical trials. We are exploring additional disease targets, and we are also very keen in understanding uh, the mode of action of that vaccine. How does it work? I showed you humoral responses, T cell responses, but clearly there is a lot more that we need to understand from uh, that, uh, that kind of vaccine. And we are also actively working uh, to develop the next generation vaccine improving the vectors and improving uh, the delivery systems. So this work is the result of a lot of people, both in our uh, US and Italian uh, lab in Novartis vaccines. And also, uh, I need to acknowledge our external collaborators, uh, Synthetic Genomics and uh, SGVI, uh, who have helped us and our partners in the uh, synthetic, um, in the synthetic vaccine production. And I also need to mention that uh, that program uh, is funded by uh, the U.S. Uh, BARDA and DARPA agencies. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Could you give us some idea of the costs that are involved? No. <laughs> no, in terms, um, well, I don't know if you, were, if you were here this morning when uh, Dr. Rapoli presented, I mean, we had the video from uh, his talk um, at the April session. So essentially, he was making the comparison between what it takes to have for influenza to have egg-derived produced vaccines versus cell culture, which is already reducing uh, a lot, to essentially a single 15 ml tubes for an enzymatic reaction. So costs are much lower than what we have uh, today. Now, exact numbers, no, I cannot tell you. No, I, I was just wondering, because the materials that you're using in that 15 mil reactor are complicated things like nucleotides, trinucleotides, and, uh, you know, sort of, um, it, it's not a sort of a simple sort of uh, reaction mixture that you would get from animal serum and, you know, a bit of stuff off the, uh, off the, off the kitchen shelf. Um, so I was wondering whether that basically made a difference to the, um, the costs. Not to that extent, not to my knowledge. Thank you. I just have a question about the concentration of SAM and compa compared to another delivery system like VRP or so. In terms of the molecule that you are using, assuming you have, like, let's say, 10 kb uh, sequence, uh, are you using like 10 to the 9 uh, RNA molecule compared to the 10 to the 6 of package with a vector or something. Can you do a comparison so we know where you are? We did not do the calculation in that uh, to, to have a direct comparison uh, between the VRPs in terms of, uh, of particles versus RNA molecules. Um, the advantage that we have by formulating the, that RNA, that self-amplifying RNA, uh, is already in the order of magnitude of uh, four to five fold more to what uh, we can get with conventional RNA. So, for example, the non-human non primate uh, study that I showed you uh, was done with 50 microgram, and we are uh, reaching very uh, good immunogenicity levels with those doses. So even in humans, um, the, the calculation was based uh, with a 100 microgram dose, it's likely uh, overestimated. We have, we have to work also clearly on the, the adjuvant, the, I mean on the system delivery because there is uh, the added benefit of adjuvanting, adjuvanting those. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for what I think is a very, very exciting 
uh, advance in our knowledge in developing medical countermeasures. Um, it's great that the technology that you've just told us about, Sam, will kind of revolutionize the way we develop vaccines. Are you already in talks with the likes of uh, the FDA, the regulatory authorities, on this? So uh, we are approaching the regulatory uh, authorities or as clearly we want to move uh, towards uh, clinical trials. So we needed proof of concept um, and a very strong package uh, to also convince ourselves that this was something that uh, we wanted to move forward. So we are, we are right now in the process of discussing um, that approach with the regulatory authorities.